Okay, well, thank you, Glenn. That was uh, informative, and that was a great segue. Um, I'm Michael Benchiker from Ackerman Center Fit, and we're going to carry the theme forward to a point where <clears throat> you have an artist that, either because they're spending a lot of time here, or because they've decided that they really should be making their home here because of the opportunities. Um, and then they need to explore permanent residency, known as a green card. Um, primarily, there are two paths in this kind of artist and entertainment world that um, permanent residency would, would entail. There are other ones, like Glenn said, but we don't have the time today to discuss those. So we're going to talk about the two most common ones in this industry. Um, the first one is called the labor certification process. And the second one is called the first press for its alien of extraordinary ability designation, which should sound a little bit familiar based on the old one. Um, we're going to start with labor certification. And we'll take it a little bit slower. <laughs> labor certification is a process where if someone is not rising to the level of extraordinary, which we discussed on the O1, we're going to discuss on the next um, uh, permanent residency um, uh, process, they kind of fit somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> They need to have an employer, not an agent, an employer, an actual uh, sponsor who is going to demonstrate to the U.S. government, and there will be three government agencies involved here, that this person is highly skilled or professional and that they are willing to go out and conduct a recruitment campaign for a period of at least 60 days to demonstrate that they have tried to find somebody that is comparable or better than the individual that they are looking to sponsor to come and work for them on an indefinite permanent basis. However, after having gone through the whole process, the results have not yielded anybody as qualified. Okay. That, in a nutshell, is called the labor certification process. Now, this process starts out with the Department of Labor. It has nothing to do with U.S. immigration on the front end. All right? The Department of Labor has been authorized by the immigration regulations to conduct this part of the process. All right? It is very much a employer-driven system on the front end, the way recruitment works. And then when it comes to the time of actually filing, the filing is done electronically through what's called the PERM system, okay? Program Electronic Record Management System. So what they are looking for is, again, like I said, that from within a 30 to 180 day advertising campaign, the employer has attempted in six different mediums to find somebody that is comparable or better. Okay, can we hold that until the end of this part of the process? Yeah. Okay. Um, of these six mediums, there are three mandatory mediums and there are three discretionary mediums. The three mandatory ones are each state has a local workforce job bank here in Tallahassee they have one, all right? Typically, the state capital would have one. And what you have to do as an employer is post what's called um, a 30-day ad in that state workforce agency, we call it the SWA, um, employment portal, and demonstrate that the state, not the federal labor, uh, Department of Labor, but the state, is attempting on a local level to advertise this position. So that's a mandatory mistake. Another mandatory is um, a posting, an on-site job posting. All right? And that's literally 
a copy of the advertisement explaining what it is, what the job is, what the purported salary is going to be, and you post it right on the wall somewhere where employees um, and other interested parties would be able to see that you are attempting to recruit internally. The other mandatory of the three is your Sunday newspapers, okay? They want you to go to your Sunday Miami Herald or whatever your local newspaper is, that Sunday edition for two Sundays. They don't have to be consecutive Sundays, but certainly they should be within the time frame that you're recruiting. All right, those are your three mandatory ones, okay? The state workforce agency for 30 days, um, an internal posting that has to be for 10 days, okay, 10 business days, um, and two Sunday newspapers. Those are your three mandatory ones. Then you have three discretionary ones. There's a laundry list, there's about 12 different mediums that the Department of Labor will accept, anything from job fairs, to industry publications, um, internal employee referral programs, external websites, internal websites, local, uh, maybe weekly newspapers as well. And at least three on that discretionary side will also be acceptable, okay? So there are your six recruitment mediums. The other thing that you must do is get what's called a prevailing wage determination. Um, this is typically done at the, prior to your recruitment, actually. A prevailing wage determination is a request, again, to the Department of Labor uh, to provide you with what they deem to be the prevailing wage based on the specificities of this proposed position and the geographical location. Specificities typically are what the position is, uh, is there any supervisory aspect to this position? What experience, both educationally and or um, from a training or employment standpoint, you would require? You submit it through the online system to the Department of Labor, and then they will email you your prevailing wage determination. This wage determination uh, has an expiration date on it, and you have to show that you have either started your first recruitment or that you have filed the whole uh, application for permanent residency prior to the expiration date. Okay? And a prevailing wage is not a minimum wage like you have in the labor world. It is a special wage that is designated for this process. And your position has to pay at least prevailing wage. You also have to demonstrate that as a company sponsor, as a petitioner, you have the financial ability to pay that wage. You can't just throw out a job offer and uh, worry about paying them if you can't demonstrate that you have the money at the start of the process. And typically this is shown if you're a larger company with more than 100 employees, you can just demonstrate this with a letter from uh, your CFO if you're a smaller company, you can show based on tax returns, or in the, if the individual is working for you, which is possible through an O-1 or another visa potentially, um, you can show that they've already been working for you temporarily and they're already making that money, okay? Uh, so again, the idea is you want to conduct this recruitment as openly and as transparently as possible so that if you were ever challenged, you can demonstrate we were as even-handed as possible. We did not tailor this process to this specific employee. Okay? Um, the other thing that you have to do is prepare what's called an audit file and a recruitment report because you don't have to submit any of this information. You, the Department of Labor may never see it, but you have to have it in the event that you do get audited which could happen mid-process or even down the road after the person has a brief card. Okay? The filing is done online on what's called a 9089 uh, electronic application. There is also a mail-in procedure. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, assuming that you have certification, and again, we'll talk about guidelines. They tell us four to six months, right, Glenn? 
right now on perm, but um, I hesitate to pin down any time frame when it comes to the government. Um, the next, they could, like I said, they could audit the file midstream and say, okay, we have, um, uh, we have reviewed everything that is coming and we'd like to see your recruitment report. We'd like to see a list of the applicants that did come in. We'd like to audit it ourselves and make sure we conducted the process as evenly as possible. They give you 30 days to respond to that. Uh, the idea here is it's stuff you should already have in the file, not a big deal to respond to, maybe an issue or two that they want you to tweak. But again, that will uh, put the file on a backlog queue because now it's in audit review and that adds another four to six months to be ready four to six months. So again, guidelines, that's all they are. Okay. So once the application is certified by the Department of Labor, you get a nice um, uh, document saying it's certified. Uh, you then have 180 days to take that certification and prepare a petition for the USCIS uh, so that they can adjudicate it and finalize the approvability of this person to be coming over as a permanent resident. Okay. Um, there is a premium processing program for that as well, for the I-140 petition, uh, where you would pay $12.25. Uh, however, that does not mean that they're all set and they have their green card. There's a few variables that are involved in that. One of them is the issue of priority dates. All right, Just because you are approved, it doesn't mean that there is an immediate immigrant visa available for you. Um, often there are too many visa applications that go through the process in one year to, um, and that year's quota becomes retrogressed and overextended essentially. So you may still have two or three years to wait before you get that final green card in hand, sometimes even longer, okay, through this labor certification program. All right. Certain countries are even more oversubscribed, like India and China and the Philippines. Okay? Um, now, so if your priority date is current, then you can apply for uh, the final process to adjust that approved petition to a green card. Um, and that would be available for the uh, beneficiary, the alien, the foreign national, <laughs> all this terminology, um, and any family members that are determined to be immediate relatives. That is a spouse um, and or uh, any children under 21 years old. They don't have to do anything more than to get to this last stage of the process and they tag <laughs> along the whole family, get green cards. Okay? Um, and again, a foreign national can be sponsored for this permanent residency process via labor certification, even if they're already in the United States with a temporary work visa such as an old one, all right? So if you find there's that scenario like Glenn was talking about where they keep renewing and renewing, then you say, you know what, you got another three years, let's go through this process and upgrade you when you get to the end of this permanent residency, okay? And that upgrade to permanent residency could happen through a process called adjustment of status, if they're already in the country, um, or it could happen through a process called consular processing, if they're outside of the country. Okay, and we're gonna talk more about those details um, at the end of the next section. We have about 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, we talked about the labor certification process, which is by far the most cumbersome way of uh, procuring permanent residency but sometimes you just don't have any options. The preferred way in this industry is through the uh, green card version of an alien of extraordinary ability, okay? In the green card world, there are preference categories, okay? There is EB, which means employment-based. One, two, three, four, and five. The highest level is EB1. 
The good news is that an alien of extraordinary ability, uh, same as the alien of extraordinary ability that qualifies for no one, may be eligible for the highest preference of a green card category as well. Under the regulations, <clears throat> for this first preference category, they may not need, even need a sponsor. The legal theory is that someone who is so extraordinary in their field will be in high demand from the moment that they come into the United States and have permanent residency. So unlike that whole labor certification process where, yeah, you may be in demand, okay, specific to this employer, but we don't know other ones, because uh, at the end of the day, they just want to make sure you're going to come here and you're not going to be a public charge. Somebody at this level, they're like, yeah, this guy, this person is so extraordinary, they can write their own ticket. Okay? So the EB-1 is a great opportunity for someone who rises to that real high extraordinary level. And while the regs are parallel to the O-1 in some way, the threshold really is scrutinized much higher. Okay? Uh, to basically be sponsored or conduct self-sponsorship and, um, and kind of write their own ticket. Now, the idea over here is to show that they either won a major internationally recognized award, again, like we discussed, and you, you've got a Grammy, uh, you, you have a Pulitzer, um, you're in, all right, done. Um, or you have the three out of the ten categories um, that um, are shown below. And again, with some discretion if you don't meet the three exactly. Uh, so again, similar to what we discussed with the O-1, um, national awards, um, memberships of very, very exclusive peer groups where you have to reach a th certain threshold, published material about you, the, the foreign national, um, in major media markets. Again, the more and the clearer and the more recognizable the better because you're going to have somebody sitting there in an immigration service center, like we discussed earlier, that is not that familiar uh, with anything outside of that small world of major metropolitan markets. Okay? If the individual has been asked to judge in their field, if they've innovated something, again, more so on the scientific side, but certainly on the artistic side, this could happen. Scholarly articles, exhibitions, if they command a high salary. And high salary, I think, at this level, Glenn, is pretty much something that shouldn't be an issue. Um, they will be able to command a high salary if, if they're at this level of international play. Okay? And commercial success, again, in the performing arts. Uh, it's interesting to see the regs still have stuff like cassettes, compact discs, and video on them. All right? Okay. Um, so if you reach that threshold, all you simply do is file your application, that I-140 immigrant petition, with the Immigration Service, and they could approve you fairly quickly. There is a premium processing program available uh, for this level as well. Um, okay, so now we have either been approved by the Immigration Service because we went through labor certification, our priority date is current or we got through extraordinary ability and we have an approved I-140. What next? We go back to activating that final permanent residency. Okay? Um, think of it this way. Just because the I-140 immigrant petition was approved and you've been deemed to be a qualified employee for labor certification or you're an extraordinary ability alien, that's nice and all, but they want to make sure that there's nothing that prevents you from coming into the United States um, and becoming a permanent resident. The idea is, in a nutshell, if you've had any kind of a criminal background, if you've had any serious problems or violations with immigration, um, if you have anything medical or communicable that could be problematic, um, then they need you to take care of that or you still won't be able to get your green card. So the idea is, the I-140 shows approvability to get that permanent residency, okay? Um, so how is that process conducted? Um, the activation, okay? Um, if you are in the United States, 
you do it to what's called adjustment of status. This is a series of applications that um, you would file with the Immigration Service Center. You would conduct medical tests here. You would get, be called for fingerprints and biometric screening in the United States. And the nice part is that while it's pending, you are considered legal. Let's say your O-1 has already run out and your final green card application hasn't been approved yet. That's okay, you're still considered legal. And as an added bonus, while you're in that process of adjusting your status, they will give you and all family members that are eligible a work permit and a travel permit called an advanced parole. So for the most part, you can have a quasi-normal life um, and you can work and the spouse can work, the kids can work, get social security numbers, and travel internationally while this final activation is pending. Two minute warning. So that's perfect time. So that's <laughs> a, um, a great benefit of the uh, adjustment of status process. Consular processing has also been uh, popular because it's deemed to be quicker. Uh, you just get called, you apply, you go to your home country, at your home consulate, you get all of um, the fingerprinting done and the medicals done, and you come in with your green card. Again, it really has become six of one, half dozen of the other. If you have your person that's going back and forth a lot, consular processing is probably the best bet because they're really not residing here. If they're already in the United States on some kind of a long-term O-1 or temporary visa, adjustment of status is probably the best bet because they've already been settled here, they have a home here, their family's here, and it's just kind of a ramp up, and then they would get their final permanent residency in the United States. And um, I'm done. Do they have any okay. questions at all? I know you have questions. I was, in the consular processing, Yes. It's, there seems to be a subjective element. Because when you're saying, you know, whether you can substitute one person from another, a US, U.S. citizen via a foreign national, um, especially in this area in which you're talking about artistic people, there's a huge subjective element. I, I'm I mean, not sure. So well, substituting a consular second processing? Violinist, okay. You want to get a consular processing is this on the green card side? Yes. Okay, I'm not sure where substitution comes in. Maybe well, uh, substituting, uh, you, you advertise for the U.S. nationals. You're talking about, the, you're talking about the labor certification say, There process. are U.S. nationals, yes. but, but I still want to take the alien. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'm saying uh, it seems to me a very discretionary uh, Here's criteria, the, especially yeah, when you're talking yeah, about Yeah, and, and you're right. And here's the idea behind PERM, labor certification. It probably is very, very discretionary from that standpoint. But no one is going to be in a better position than the actual employer slash petitioner themselves to make that call because they know their industry and they know what they're looking for. Moreover, even though they're not supposed to take this into consideration, but of course, you know, they do, they've known this person. And if they're about to undertake a process which is gonna take years sometimes, and a significant investment in advertising costs, legal fees, uh, and um, filing fees to the government, they're gonna be pretty sure that this person is really the best candidate, but for anything better that walks in the door. And we certainly have seen that happen from time to time, and as the lawyers, it's our job to explain to the employer, they'll say, look, you know, I got this guy, this candidate that came in, they're really good. Well, you want to hire them, are they your ideal person? Well, no, I really like this guy better, but maybe I want to hire them as well. So we will cancel them, look, you may still be able to hire them, you know, for something that would be, you know, a similar position or another position. But in terms of the substitution element, Typically, that discretion has already been taken into consideration at that point. Is that clear? Is it, it's, it's really, no one is going to go into this process, because aside from all the financial investment, there is also an um, uh, investment from, from the standpoint of you as a company are putting yourself out there to three different agencies. You know, the Department of Labor is scrutinizing you at least twice. 
uh, immigration, which is homeland security, and then if you go to consular processing, that's the part of the state. All right, so I think that's really the practical reality of labor certification. Glenn, do you have anything to add? No, I, I, I've never done the substitution. It's my memory that they eliminate, the Department of Labor eliminated. It used to be if you had an approved labor certification application, which means you've shown you couldn't find a qualified U.S. worker, that you could later substitute. Let's but say you had an alien in yeah, mind. Yeah, but that, yeah, that, yeah, that's, I, but I don't know that that was, was that your question? I thought that was the question, that I, that I had one alien in mind when I did my labor certification, and now all of a sudden I have somebody else in mind, and I'm going to just plop that person in instead. And I don't believe you can do that anymore. I, no, have, I didn't follow it because I never had the need to do it, but I'm pretty sure five, yeah. six years ago it was yeah. eliminated. Back, back in um, 2007, they eliminated it. Um, but it used to be, if you had a labor certification that was approved, um, you could use it at any time for any qualified foreign national. Um, there wasn't even that six month, that 180 day, you must file with USCIS rule. Um, so yes, there was a time when actual foreign uh, let's say it fell through with your original foreign national. Like, man, that that you know, I went through this whole process. Now the guy got a better job offer. He left. Um, yeah, if you have another foreign national that met the met the criteria, because this is not available anymore, you could plug them in there, and they can substitute. But I think you're alluding to if you have a, fo a, a an American that has applied through labor certification, how do you treat them, and where is their discretion involved, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, but that was really interesting. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, it seems likely to happen, yeah. Yeah, but it's been gone since 2007. Oh, yeah, so. Other questions? Well, thank you both. Okay. okay.